Majora's Mask, Chapter 22, Stained Tabula Rasa, Part 2. Think it's safe to come out now? The imp's complete silence terrified Link. The Skull Kid could be anywhere. He and Tattle remained huddled in the Diku Flower's moist darkness, hearing only the frantic, hushed voices of the townspeople. The Skull Kid's booming monologue had ended long ago. Don't put that pressure on me! Tattle whispered. I'm stuck in here too. I've got no idea. Well, Link thought. I've got to come out eventually. He took a deep breath, slowly slipping out of the plant. The first step his bare Deku feet took was light on the eastern plaza's stone. He pulled the rest of himself out until he stood upright, blonde hair messy and resting over orange eyes. The bag hugged his side, which he removed right before transforming so he could stow Tattle away. From beside the stockpot inn, Link watched villagers sprinting for shelter. Others wandered, uncertainly, always glancing over Link's head, presumably at the clock tower. That must be where the Skull Kid is, he thought. Link refused to turn around. He imagined the orange eyes of the mask bearing into his back, daring him to acknowledge its presence. <gasps> Come back! A woman shrieked from South Clock Town. There! There! Bring him back! What do we do now? Link whispered. His high-pitched voice couldn't hide his fear. We need to hide, the fairy said. People laid against the wall where the eastern gate had been. Some clawed at its bricks as if hoping they would reopen. No one paid attention to the lone Deku scrub. Link's suspicious behavior was indistinguishable from the town's complete anarchy. We can't just let them die, Link said. I'm not the coward that he thinks I am. Confronting him would be stupid. We'd be dead before we even reach the tower. Everyone in Clock Town will be crushed by the moon in three days anyways, Link. Shh! Talk quieter! And don't use my name! He doesn't know your name, Tattle said. Link hardly registered her comment, looking around to ensure no one had overheard. He called you boy, and no one else here will remember you since we just played the Song of Time. But he did say that I have a fairy with me, Link said, wanting to go somewhere before he raised suspicion. He was deathly afraid to try, though, lest he accidentally met Majora's eyes. Unhiding's pointless. It's like he said, we're trapped. We only have 72 hours before the moon falls, and time traveling would make us sitting ducks right underneath him. Do you think he travels back in time with us? Tattle asked. Is that what the black mark on your ocarina did? Maybe, Link said, turning to see a villager staring at him. The man had been banging on the doors of a shop, but no one would answer his pleas for shelter. His eyes narrowed at the Deku scrub walking around in slow circles, whispering to a fairy. Link turned away quickly, his cheeks warm with fear. Look, I need to go somewhere now. We can't hide, so... Come up with something else. Hiding's all I've got, the fairy said. Where? Link whispered. The stunt put in. Link took her advice without hesitation, walking briskly to the hotel. However, the front door wouldn't budge. Uh, It's locked. Uh, Use the Deku flower to get up on the roof. There's a door outside on the second story, remember? Tattle hid in the scrub's bag again, and Link was soon leaping out of the Deku plant with a flower in each hand. 
He landed on the awning as the propellers fell away. Link passed by the town bell and reached the second-story door. The South Clocktown woman's distant screaming had stopped. Which might not be a good thing, he thought. The sky was still young with the new day. Hardly half an hour had passed in this cycle. The door was unlocked, and he slipped inside, stepping onto the hard wood of the hallway. The top of the staircase was just to his right. The building was completely silent, aside from a distant ticking clock. Deku Scrub traveled down the stairs, his feet hardly making a noise. When he rounded the corner into the lobby, he found it deserted. His snout moved to speak, but he stopped himself, wondering how far his voice would travel in the still air of the silent building. This hotel doesn't open until eight. Link knew. What if someone finds me and throws me out? What are you doing here? Link jumped, turning to see Anju already in the stairwell. Her skirt and red hair were exactly as they always were, but her expression was new. Her face bore the same stunned horror overtaking everyone in Clocktown. I'm sorry. Link stammered. We had a, a reservation, but the door was locked. We didn't have anywhere else to, to, to hide. We, Anju said. Link's face grew warm again. I'm so bad at lying. His heart thumped loudly in his ears, but he hoped that his Deku form hid his red cheeks. He realized that Anju was taking note of his blonde bangs. Bring me the boy in the green tunic with the funnel-shaped hat and the blonde hair. He recalled the Skull Kid saying, the imp had never specified a race. Link's orange eyes noticed her gaze flicker to his bag. They remained standing apart from one another, untrusting. Anju broke the silence. Do you have a name? Uh, um, yes. Link said. Um, you'll have to tell me what it is so I can check my log? Anju said. Link could feel the tension in the air as she descended the staircase and reached her desk. The innkeeper cautiously eyed the speechless Deku scrub as she checked her records. Should I tell her the truth? Link wondered. He reached for the strap on his bag regardless, which caused Anju to immediately freak out. She gasped, backing into her desk for support. No, no, wait! Link exclaimed. I'm not going to hurt you. I, I just, uh, um... He sighed, dropping the bag to the floor. Tattle, whose irritated, silent commentary was easy to imagine, remained inside. Link brought his hands to his face and brought them down with the Deku mask. His human face, funnel-shaped hat, and green tunic were now visible. Anju's eyes went wide. Anju, you have to remember, Link said. He waited for Anju to say something, but she only shook her head. My name's Link, blue eyes now intent upon hers. We were best friends in Hyrule together, but here in Termina, you can't remember me. I don't know why. I'm not even sure where Termina is because no one in Clocktown has even heard of Hyrule. But I need your help. That person attacking Clocktown is the Skull Kid. I've been trying to stop him by using ma magic to relive the same three days, but now the Skull Kid is traveling back with us. If I try to go back in time again, he'll kill me. I come to the stockpot in almost every cycle to take Ink's reservation, and on a few of those, we've actually gotten to know each other again, like we did in Hyrule. Anju's face was completely blank, comprehension and belief obviously far away. I know how crazy all of this sounds, Link began, looking down as he wondered what exactly he was doing. But I need you... I don't have anywhere else to hide, and I'm the only one that can stop the Skull Kid. If you or anyone else turns me in, then you'll all die when the moon crashes into Clocktown three days from now. Anju jumped when a fairy flew out of his bag. Tattle directed a heavy sigh and poisonous glare at Link before turning to Anju. <sighs> Look, my part 
partner didn't mean to throw all of that at you. He can be a bit overwhelming, but it's all true, and we can't let the Skull Kid turn us against each other. Why should I believe anything you're saying? Anju said. She found the courage to step forward and raise her voice. I've never met you before, and you seem very dangerous. You brought a demon into town, broke into my hotel, and now you accuse me of wanting to turn you in? Link was speechless. You mean you weren't going to? No, she said, eyeing his sword. At least, I don't plan to. But if you even think about drawing your sword, I'm not here to hurt you, Link insisted. There are plenty of people upstairs who will defend me. Anju, can you please listen? No, you listen, the innkeeper said, stepping around her desk to meet Link face to face. You can't break into my hotel and expect me to believe you're a time-traveling hero from another world. Link, maybe we should go, Tattle whispered, but Link refused. Then I'll prove it to you, he said. The fairy had no idea where he was going with this, puzzled as she waited for him to continue. <sighs> Café is supposed to send you a letter today. Anju's anger immediately melted away. You'll get it this afternoon. It says that he still loves you and that he wants to be with you. He just can't right now because something's stopping him. He didn't say what. But it doesn't matter. The point is he's still alive and promised to come back in time for the carnival. How do you know about Café? I told you already, Link said. I've lived through these three days more than once. You've told me about him and I've read the letter he sends you. He suddenly realized that this whole appeal to the mail was rather stupid, given that the events outside would stop it from being delivered. <laughs> um... The mail probably won't come anymore because of the Skull Kid, but the letter might still be in the post box. I could go get it for you and, and show you. No, you can't, Tattle interrupted. You'd be turning yourself in if you stepped foot anywhere near South Clock Town. The post office is in South Clock Town, Anju replied. But the letter is there, Link said. He asks you to respond through the mailbox near the laundry pool. Anju still had nothing affirming to say, her mind clearly racing as she processed everything. Listen, the letter's there and in his handwriting. If you can give us a chance to get it... Link, I already told you we can't do that! Tattle repeated. Then I'll go, Anju said, walking over to the desk and grabbing a cloak. She threw it over her shoulders and pulled it close together. You'll go? Tattle asked. Anju stopped, her back to them. I thought Café was dead. If there's proof that he's still alive, then I'm getting it. When she took another breath, it shook. This imp said he wouldn't hurt anyone until an hour had passed, so I'll be fine. The key to the knife chamber is in the second drawer from the left. That, that's the room Ink was under. She opened the door, closed it behind her, and left them in the lobby. Ling and Tattle stood there for a moment in silence, staring at the door. The fairy, naturally, was the one who broke it. You idiot! Next time you decide to throw everything out in the open, tell me! Your stupidity never ceases to amaze me! I swear to Din, you don't think twice before you do anything! Link didn't care. He smiled instead, because for the moment... They'd evaded death. He opened his mouth to say something, but the noise of someone running down the stairs interrupted him. The fairy and boy exchanged a horrified glance. Before the person saw them, Tattle flew into the bag lying on the floor and Link threw on his Tiku mask. A large, middle-aged and red-haired lady with a strong resemblance to Anju came into the lobby. Her eyes instantly found the Tiku scrub by himself, bending down to pick up a bag lying on the floor. Who are you? She asked. Uh, ink! He responded quickly, swallowing his nerves again. How did you get in here? Aren't you let me in? I had a reservation. The woman's skepticism faded as she took in the Deku Scrub's helpless young appearance, 
His bright orange eyes shone with nothing but innocence. She left a few seconds ago, and she said she'd be back in a minute. Where are your parents? She asked. Uh, they won't be here for another three days. I came to get the room early so they could still have one for the carnival. <laughs> the lady sighed rather than barraging him with more questions. I'm not sure there's going to be a carnival anymore. Did she tell you what room was yours? The knife chamber? She walked over to the desk and retrieved the key. Here, it's not safe outside anymore. Stay with us until this mess blows over. Thank you. He took the key and left without another word. For once in his life, he'd successfully pulled off a string of lies. And I didn't even blush, Link thought. Maybe there is hope for me. She entered from the west staircase flanking the clock tower, stepping into the plaza with the cloak still drawn over her head. Anju stood horrified as she took in the grisly scene. A burnt, charred pile of wood lay in place of the watchtower. The air Anju took in was thick and heavy with burning. Vestiges of smoke still rose from the blackened construction project. She spotted an elderly woman fallen to her knees in the middle of the pile. A young adult man lay in her arms, her head cradled against her shoulder. His body was as charred as the wood, mouth slightly open and eyes closed. He'd been one of the carpenters. But Anju couldn't identify which one. The woman's face was streaked with tears, but she appeared to have stopped crying some time ago, now silently rocking his body back and forth. Anju uncertainly stepped toward the older woman. South Clocktown was deserted otherwise, appearing more like a prison now that the southern gate was sealed shut. She noticed two other corpses, both buried in the rubble and unattended by anyone. Anju stepped over a large piece of debris to stop just behind the woman. She never turned away from the corpse. Um, you can stay in our hotel, Anju said eventually. She'd worn the cloak to hide her identity and prevent hundreds from begging her to stay. As mother would have instructed, she thought. But Anju couldn't ignore this grieving mother. It won't be safe here soon. The innkeeper looked up to the plaza's massive clock face and froze, but it wasn't the time that scared her. The Skull Kid's wicked mask bore down directly at her. Anju opened her mouth in shock, unable to rip her eyes away from the orange orbs. They seemed to stare directly into her soul, even from such a great distance. Anju eventually turned back to the woman, who still paid her no attention. Please, the innkeeper said. It's not safe. The guard tried to get me to leave too, the woman eventually said. Her voice sounded so tired and worn. There's no point. You don't have to die with him, Anju insisted. You'd be safe with me. The woman didn't respond. She continued stroking what remained of the body's face, never crying, shouting, or looking away. It's not my place to convince her, the innkeeper eventually decided. It's her choice to stay here. Anju turned away from the sad scene, keeping her head down as she walked to the post box near the laundry pool. She didn't turn back to check on the grieving mother again, partly because she had nothing else to offer her, and partly because she feared meeting the Skull Kid's eyes again. Anju pulled out a key when she reached the red box, which she'd retrieved from the post office in West Clock Town. You want to check the mail right now? The postman had exclaimed in disbelief. Uh, be my guest. Just try not to die. Whoa. The mailbox swung open to reveal a single letter. Anju's heart raced, her fingers wrapped around the envelope carefully, as if afraid it might bite her. Before turning it over to see the front, she took in a deep breath. It's addressed to me. Anju almost ripped open the envelope without thinking. She stopped when she felt someone behind her. Anju turned around, and suddenly, the mask imp was an inch from her nose. Her scream never came as she trembled, backing into the open mailbox. The Skull Kid didn't move. 
<laughs> I know you're hiding him. The imp said plainly. There was nowhere else for him to go. He waited as if for some confirmation, but Anju was incapable of saying anything. I knew that would happen, though. It's all part of my plan, you see. I want him to suffer. I want to destroy him emotionally before I kill him. And you know how I intend to do that. Anju eventually found the courage to shake her head. The masked imp flew right next to her ear, lifting his mask to whisper in a voice devoid of humanity. I'm going to make sure he's here to see it when I kill you. Well, here we finally are, hiding. Now what? Deku Link sat on his knife chamber bed, and Tattle lay on the one opposite him. She was ready to hide in the open bag beside her at a moment's notice. I don't know, the fairy replied. We should probably give it more time. We don't have more time. Someone's going to die in a few minutes. Because of me. No, not because of you. Because of the Skull Kid. If it wasn't now, then they were going to die when the moon fell anyways. <clears throat> that doesn't change the fact that he's killing them now. I know, but there's nothing we can do. If you go out there and try to save whatever stranger he chooses, everyone in all of Termina loses. What if it's not a stranger? Link asked. Tattle didn't have a reply to that one, looking away at the wall instead. Then I guess they're out of luck? Link thought. Too bad? He refused to accept that as an answer. He wouldn't let someone that he cared about die. A few minutes later, there was a knock at the door. Tattle instantly sprung into the bag just as it opened a crack. It's me? Came Anju's voice from the other side. Come in! Link answered. Tattle's alarm faded as she flew to rejoin them. Anju closed the door behind her, pausing as she brought her hands together just in front of her. That's your disguise, right? Oh! Link stammered, removing his mask. Sorry, I didn't know it was you, and I wasn't sure how the others would react. I haven't told anyone else, Anju said. It's good for you to be careful. Did you find the letter? Tettle asked. I did, Anju said. And I'm going to let you two keep hiding here. I'm not sure what's going on, but that evil child wouldn't stop hurting us, even if someone turned you two in. Do you plan on stopping him? Somehow. Yes, Link said, but we're not sure how yet. Right, she said simply. Anju didn't turn away to leave or say goodbye. She stood in the middle of the room instead, as if paralyzed with indecision. He found the silence a little bit awkward. Is something wrong? Link asked. No, she said. I was just wondering... If you knew anything else about Café. Instantly, Link's mind flashed to Anju's house in Hyrule. He'd spent so many hours there with her as she grieved Café's death. No, he lied. Anju appeared disappointed, but he refused to tell her the truth. And truthfully, he didn't know if Termina Café was dead just because Hyrule Café was. But that doesn't mean we can't find out for ourselves. Link slipped off the bed and pulled the ocarina from his belt, showing it to her. Every time I play a certain song on this, it sends me back to six in the morning on this day, directly in front of the clock tower doors. The carnival starts in three days at midnight, and not long after that, the moon will fall and destroy Termina. The Skull Kid, that imp with the mask, is what makes that happen. And now it's gotten worse, because he's found a way to come back in time with me. Anju nodded in vague understanding. The point is, I have the ability to relive these same three days. If we can find a way out to remove the Skull Kit from the equation, we'd have all the time in the world to look for Café. You mean, you could take me back with you? Anju asked. Yes, Link said, remembering the first time he'd revealed all of this to her. That cycle, she'd refused to go back in time. She'd been afraid of leaving that cycle's cafe behind to die under the moon. 
I wonder what's changing her mind this time, he thought. The Skull Kid becoming such a direct threat might have something to do with it. At least, I think so. It lets me take Tattle with me. That's my fairy. All of my weapons and tools come back too. Anju took a moment to process that. I must be crazy for believing all of this, she eventually said. You must imagine how this all sounds. Link nodded. <sighs> yeah, absolutely insane. But I have to believe you. There's nothing else left. Anju turned to leave the room. Just don't let any of the others see you. I'll bring you food since we have plenty in the kitchen. Let me know when you find out how you plan on handling the... Monster outside. I will. She closed the door behind her, leaving them to their own devices. Bringing hope to a town full of doomed people? The fairy said. Link wasn't sure he understood her point. And? It's not a good thing, she explained. Hope is great, but you're setting them up for disappointment. Extreme disappointment? Like, oh, Din, the moon is crushing me and I'm dying a horrible and painful death. Level disappointment. Link scoffed. Aren't you the one who's been convincing me to lighten up and be more hopeful lately? <laughs> yes, but that's before you started getting others involved. What are you going to do once you bring Anju back? Drag her along to the mountains with us so she can get eaten by a monster? Leave her in Clocktown while we go on an adventure? That means we'd have to march all the way back here after we're done versus just playing the Song of Time wherever we are. Plus, she'll have to wait in constant dread of us not coming back before the moon fell. And you don't even know if it's possible for her to come back in time with us. Also, what if after we play the song, there are two of her that she won't even have the stuff put in to wait at? We'll figure something out, Link blurted. Do you see how annoying this is? Tattle exclaimed. It's always between two extremes with you. Either you've given up all hope or you're plunging into situations headfirst without thinking about them. I know what I'm doing. Time's up. <laughs> Link and Tattle froze at the sound of the voice. It was the Skull Kids. Once more, it was echoing through the entire town, bouncing off the sealed walls and traveling clearly through every building. And our brave hero is nowhere to be found. I would say I'm surprised, but I'd be lying. You humans have proven to be nothing but spineless, self-absorbed creatures. I expected nothing less from our fairy boy. The knife chamber's window revealed nothing but an alleyway wall. Link and Tattle could only stare at one another fearfully. Everyone in the town waited from whatever hiding place they'd scrounged together. The streets were void of life in all four districts, except for one person. The Skull Kid remained floating in front of the clock tower as he spoke, looking into the plaza where the old woman cradled her dead son. And who better to begin our string of sacrifices than the woman who's already lost everything? <laughs> the imp laughed so hard that he cried. Imagining the horrified faces of the townspeople as they cowered and listened, he floated down as he wiped the tears from his eyes. <laughs> I should be thanked for my generosity. I could take someone with years yet to look forward to. As he drifted to the ground, the old woman refused to look up. She merely held her son's head and stared at his burnt eyes. The masked imp was furious. Look at me, he thought. Look, look at, at me, me when, when I kill you. you. But that changed when he saw a tear roll along her cheek. It landed in a wet patch on the corpse's face from where all the others had fallen. He tilted his head to the side in curiosity. Are you not afraid to die? He asked, no longer using magic to amplify his voice. No. She breathed softly, shaking. If the gods will take me now, then let them. I have nothing left in this world. The Skull Kid's mind flashed to all the others he'd killed, who'd ran away from him and screamed for their lives to be spared. This was something he had never seen before. The masked imp turned around to look at the clock. It was almost 7.01. A whole minute had nearly passed and still no one was dead. 
You can't stop now. The mask whispered to him. You must keep your word. She's just as pathetic as the rest of them. Don't let her tears fool you. They fall for herself, not for her son. She's lying. The Skull Kid wasn't sure if he believed Majora. Stop! A voice boomed from behind the imp. The Skull Kid spun around to see a spear hurtling towards his face. He barely dodged it in time. The spear zipped right past his ear and landed far away. The imp found the guard responsible, his arm still thrust outward to throw his weapon. Three other guards, all equipped with the same shining armor and spears, stood behind him. The guard's eyes went wide with shock when he realized he'd missed. Majora's orange eyes didn't look away. The guard began gulping before he continued. You're under arrest for terrorizing the town. The Skull Kid's only response was his cold stare until he broke out into laughter again. A second guard threw their spear. The Skull Kid finished laughing just in time to stop it with a spell. He redirected it with ten times the force, sending it directly through the assailant's chest. The guard buckled to his knees, mouth wide open as blood shot out from his back. The third and fourth ones charged forward with their spears at the ready. The Skull Kid, with a single swipe of his arm, engulfed both in purple fire. The masked imp turned to the remaining guard who'd thrown the first spear. Wait! Please! The Skull Kid shot out his arm and never broke his stare. The guard flew violently backward, slamming into the pole of a shopping stall. His neck broke instantly, and the guard fell limply to the ground. The Skull Kid returned to the air without looking back at the old lady. He ignored the two guards now running around and screaming as they burned alive. The masked imp flew to West Clocktown, looking up and down the alley of buildings to see no one. He flew to a random house and unleashed a torrent of fire. The building exploded into a mess of shattering windows and buckling wooden beams. Screams, both young and old, ended abruptly as the flames claimed them all. The imp regained his altitude, looking down to ensure no one escaped the burning building. None did. Your Your first first sacrifice sacrifice is complete, complete, oh noble noble green-headed warrior! (laughs) He exclaimed this so all in Clock Town could hear as he returned to the front of the clock tower. I hope you're content with the family hiding in West Clock Town, as well as the four guards who came to their defense. I'm I'm ready ready to end the bloodbath whenever you you are, are. but I will continue continue slaying as many as you wish! Link curled inward against the wall of his knife chamber bed. It it was a whole whole family. (laughs) Link stammered. The fairy rested on his shoulder, hugging him closely as the hero wept. The sky was still gray. The horse and her master walked carefully across the rocky path. To the left, the mountain sloped upward steeply. To the right, the path ended at a massive, unforgiving cliff. The blonde-headed teen, with his green hat and tunic, sword, shield, and belt adorning him, held onto the reins carefully. He led his horse at a steady pace forward. Epona was used to these dangerous expeditions, but it was best to be careful. He imagined falling off the cliff only for himself and his horse to die at the bottom. If I died, would they think I abandoned them? Or come looking for me? The clouds had stopped grumbling an hour or so ago. The sun threatened to tear through the thinning veil of cover. It had been a day since Kakariko Village and his goodbye to Andrew. After paying the Gorons a visit, he was nearing the other side of the perilous Death Mountain. There were forests on the other side, and he'd reasoned that this was the best place to begin his search for Navi. If that's really why I'm out here, he thought. He wasn't sure. 
Link found his mind constantly returning to Hyrule, which any step now he would be leaving. Somewhere after the highest mountain peak marked the northern border, and he'd passed that long ago. Why am I second guessing myself? Navi is the only person I ever thought about in Hyrule. Link wasn't sure what he hoped to gain by finding her, but he knew he had to keep pressing forward. His mind went to his stomach. It had been several hours since he ate, and Link decided to stop at the next outcrop of rock. The long, narrow pathway soon widened into a large, round break. He led Epona as far as he could inward, climbing off and opening one of the bags tied to her saddle. Link pulled out a loaf of bread and container of water. He filled a bucket so Epona could drink too, while the adventurer sat down to eat. He watched the sky brighten into afternoon. Link! After several minutes of rest, the voice came as a complete surprise. He recognized it immediately. Link turned to see the king's personal messenger riding on a horse. He was elegantly adorned, which was highly inappropriate given the dangerous mountain path. He ungracefully made his way towards Link's recess. The boy jumped to his feet and returned the bread to his bag, walking to the messenger. <sighs> his royal highness has an urgent message! <sighs> The messenger was out of breath, sliding off his horse. He made you chase me down and hand deliver it? Link asked. He realized the messenger wasn't just exhausted. He looked afraid. <laughs> it's very important, sir, <sighs> he said nervously. The king wanted me to tell you in his own words, but I didn't think I could remember them exactly, so I wrote them down. He pulled out a roll of paper and handed it to Link. Link watched the messenger skeptically, slowly wrapping his hand around the piece of paper. He felt his heart beating rapidly. Part of him didn't want to read it, but his eyes quickly scanned the page anyways. Link's face darkened with each word. I was afraid I wouldn't reach you in time. The messenger began, noticing Link's changing expression. And I only hope I haven't, but... Link thrust the letter back into the messenger's hands and sprinted to Epona. The king's assistant watched as Link led Epona back the way he came. He stopped just before passing the delivery man. Thank you, he said, but his voice shook. I'm sorry you had to come all the way out here. Then Link bolted down the path. Epona ran as swiftly as she could. Stumbling off the cliff was now a risk that Link was willing to take. The sun, now fully exposed, bore down on Link and Epona from above as they ran. He was desperate to get as far as possible, as quickly as possible. It had been a day's journey from the castle, but he'd have to make it back in double the time. Please, Link thought. Don't let this happen. This can't be real. I don't want to leave you, Link said distantly. The Hylian fountain ran behind them. The sky was in twilight illuminating the water and her beautiful face. Then don't, Zelda said. He saw the fear in her eyes, the fear that everything they had would end. Link had no response for her. There was nothing he could add that he hadn't already said. All he could manage. I love you, Zelda. And she said nothing in return. Epona's hoof slipped, Link snapped from his trance and pulled quickly on the horse's reins. Before they tumbled over the edge, Link brought them both back to safety. They stopped for a moment, reeling at the close call. Link squinted up at the bright sun before pressing onward. He awakened to a knock on his door. Link sat up in his bed, looking frantically for his Deku mask as the memories of Hyrule faded. He was unable to find it in time, but thankfully Anju entered the room, carrying a tray. Link sighed with relief, calming himself as he sat up in bed. Tattle stirred on the pillow beside him. Sorry, the innkeeper said. I didn't know you were- It's fine, Link interrupted, disgusted by the fact that he'd slept. Tattle yawned as her wings stretched outward. She quickly noted Link's perturbed expression. What's that face for? Why did you let me fall asleep? Link asked, furious. Tattle took a moment to understand, and then she shook her head. Link, you were really upset, and I wasn't about to- People are dying out there! He exclaimed. 
Link spun around to face Anju. What time is it? Five, Anju answered. He only just... She didn't finish her sentence. Five? Link exclaimed. That's four more since I... <sighs> Ten! He put his hands to his head and squeezed his eyes shut. Tattle was the one who eased the innkeeper still landing there with the tray. Sorry, the fairy said. I think this whole situation has put all of us in a mood. You can set it down on the table. Thank you. I'm just trying to help, Anju said. In any way I can. And I feel helpless, Link said, not wanting to look as she set the soup down. For Din's sake, I'm I'm hiding. There's nothing else we can do, Tattle reminded him. We can't stop him right now, and there's no way out of Clock Town. Uh, actually, Anju interrupted. They both turned to face her. There is the old sewer system. No one ever goes down there because of how dangerous it is. But that might be a way out of town. I imagine a few people tried to escape through there when he came. But they probably didn't make it. No one knows what's down there. Link scoffed. Of course! I'm such an idiot! On my first cycle here, I traveled through the sewers. If you go the right way, it takes you to the observatory outside of town. Really? Tattle asked. I didn't know that! The journey had been taken with Link's first version of Tattle, who died that night. Me and you went there after the Great Fairy told us about it. That was before... Tattle nodded to save him from finishing the statement. Will that always be a bit of an awkward spot between us? Link wondered. Uh, you think this passageway will help? Tattle asked. Maybe, Link said. We could get out of Clock Town, but then what? Eventually we'd just run out of time and we wouldn't be able to play the ocarina. We might be able to find something, Tattle offered. Like I said before, the Skull Kid goes to the mountains whenever he feels weak. Maybe we'll find something there that could stop him. Link's face brightened, suddenly filled with what he'd given Anju earlier in the day. Hope. It's a pretty big gamble, Link said. But it's still a plan, and the only one we have. The fairy turned to the innkeeper. It won't take us long to pack our bags. Mind if we check out early? <laughs> Anju tried her best to smile at the sarcasm. I promise we'll be back before the moon falls, Link said. Just stay out of the way of the Skull Kid and you'll be fine. Anju nodded. She remembered what the imp had whispered to her, but she was too scared to tell Link. Maybe that monster doesn't know about the sewers, Anju thought. Maybe Link is actually a step ahead of this murderer. So what if you're right? The dancer said, considering her sister's words. Though they both had red hair, Marilla's leotard was outlined in blue, and Judo's was red. Because, Judo said, pacing back and forth while Marilla sat on the bed. It's really weird, Marilla. Aunt you keeps disappearing into that room without ever checking on us. And I know her mom and grandmother are downstairs. Who's hiding in the knife chamber? Oh, hum, it's none of our business, Judo, remarked one of the two town jugglers in red, lying on the top of a bunk bed. It's all of our businesses, as long as that masked kid is killing us off, Judo retaliated. She's hiding something. Oh, ho, for once my brother is actually making sense, the other juggler said from the bed beneath his brother. We shouldn't make enemies out of each other. Let's just hide it out until... Until what? Judo exclaimed. We're all dead? No, I'm not just going to sit around while we're all picked off. Calm down, Marilla said. The room was darkening as the sky outside did. The man with the music box lit a candle on the room's single table. He refused to get involved in the conversation, turning his instrument instead to play more music. The five of them in the large hotel room remained hiding together. Calm down! Judo yelled. People are dying out there. And Anju's not responsible for it, Marilla said. We'd be taking you seriously if you were pointing fingers at the murderer in the sky. Well, obviously, he's the immediate cause, but... But what, Judo? Her sister began. 
What are you accusing the woman who took us in and let us hide of? I... Will you stop playing that stupid music, girl, girl? Judah snapped at the small, bald man with the music box. I swear I'm going to throw that thing against the wall. Sorry, the man said weakly, taking his hand off the handle and sighing. I'm going to figure this out myself, Judah decided, walking toward the door. You four have all the fun you want sitting around and waiting to die. No one in the room stopped her. She opened the door to their room, only a sliver. She peered down the hallway in the direction of the knife chamber, watching the closed door. Anju had just slipped inside with a tray of soup. It was only a few moments before the door opened, and the innkeeper stepped out, this time without the tray. Judo furrowed her brow and waited for the innkeeper to go down the staircase. Judo tiptoed outside the room in question. She passed quietly over the hardwood floor, her extraordinary dancing skills allowing her to move without making a sound. Eventually, she reached the door to see that it hadn't been shut completely. Judo waited for a moment, noting the voices inside, a young man's and a woman's. The dancer stealthily pulled the door open and peered inside. The room, darkened like hers by the fading daylight, contained a blonde-haired boy, illuminated by his fairy. She spotted the boy's pointy green hat and tunic. <gasps> she gasped, quickly returning the door to its initial position. She ran back to her room and flung the door open. Anju's hiding the boy that the imp's looking for! Judo exclaimed. What? Marilla said. Guru Guru and the two jugglers turned to face her as well. I saw him! She said, softer this time. He was sitting on the bed on the far end of the room talking to his fairy. He had the hat and the hair and, and the, the tunic. Uh, are you sure? Marilla asked. Yes! Judo said. Come on, let's go find some people to help us drag him to the clock tower. Ho oh, ho! What? The jugglers both said simultaneously. He had weapons. We can't do it on our own. No one moved or said anything, however, which angered Judo. How can they just sit around and do nothing? She thought. Fine, I'll go on my own. And then she left the room, slamming the door behind her. She fled from the stockpot inn and entered the early night.